Hey guys and welcome back to my channel for another midweek mystery video where today I want to share with you an unsolved case which has been dubbed the mystery of the milk carton kids, the disappearance of Patrick Warren and David Spencer. This case earned this nickname because they were among the first faces to appear on milk cartons in the UK in April 1997. I know milk carton campaigns were very popular in the USA after Eaton Pats became one of the first American missing children to have his face featured on cartons in 1979, but it wouldn't ever really catch on in the UK. Before I continue with this video though, I do want to really quickly apologise for my audio. I've had a few people point it out in the comments, I really hope nobody would notice, but of course there are lots of people who are noticing. I know the audio is a bit dodgy, a bit tinny, a bit echoey. Um, I've recently moved house and I've now got this new office space, but I'm still in the process of furnishing it. So it's quite bare at the moment, meaning it is quite echoey. I'm really sorry about it. Hopefully it will get better on working and fixing it. I may be looking at getting a new microphone, but if you know me, you'll know that I'm quite technologically illiterate, which is surprising considering what I do on the internet. Um, but I am working on it, I'm aware, and fingers crossed I'll fix it in due course. I'm just waiting for some more like soft furnishings to put in here, so hopefully it will sort of soften the sound a little bit. Anyway, let's get back to the video. Patrick and David's case was brought to my attention recently after their story hit the headlines once again. Human remains were found in the area that they disappeared in, and it's thought that it might have been them. Sadly, they turned out not to be, but I still want to share their story and spread awareness. It seems that this case has been accused of being an example of missing white woman syndrome, which is a term often used by social scientists to refer to how some missing people cases get extensive media coverage and others get very, very little. Disproportionately, the media will focus on cases involving young, white, upper middle class women or girls and push anything that doesn't fit this narrative to the sideline. I'm not sure whether this is a conscious bias or not, but there's no denying this does happen. Whilst you do hear occasionally about cases of missing women of colour or women of lower social classes and missing men or boys, it's really not as often. As Karen Charlev Green, the director of the Centre for the Study of Missing Persons, said to the BBC in 2016, with news outlets internationally, the more angelic and well-behaved and innocent they are, the more likely it is that they will get coverage. If it's two boys, you'll think they're goofing around or they've run away, and there's a little bit of an element that boys might be more self-sufficient. The case of Patrick and David very much fell victim to this missing white woman syndrome. It received very little coverage outside of the local media where they lived, so hopefully this video can help make their story a little bit more well known. It was Boxing Day, the 26th of December 1996, when 11-year-old Patrick Warren and 13-year-old David Spencer disappeared after telling their mums they were going out to visit one of Patrick's brothers who lived nearby. They both lived in Chelmsley Wood, a large housing estate just east of Birmingham, and Patrick and David spent most of that day playing together outside. They were both seen on Boxing Day afternoon playing with friends on a local frozen lake and were warned by a police officer that it was dangerous and he told them to go home. Despite this, they didn't and they remained out until close to midnight, despite their young ages. And when David returned home, he simply told his mum he was going to spend the night at Patrick's brother's house and headed out once again. But for whatever reason, Patrick and David didn't head straight to Patrick's brothers. They decided to stay out for a little bit longer. They make their way to a local petrol station where they ask the attendant for a pack of biscuits before walking away together in the direction of Chelmsley Wood Shopping Centre. This would have been about 12.45am on the 27th of December and it was the last time the boys were ever seen. Patrick was known as Paddy to his family. He was one of seven siblings to Irish parents. He loved football and he was a very cheeky child. He always had a comeback for everything apparently. His mum Bridget told the Daily Mail, there's no point saying he was an angel because he wasn't. I would say he was cheeky. But other kids' mothers used to say that Paddy was a terrific little lad. Even his teachers said he was a good lad. David, on the other hand, was a little bit more troubled. His mother, Christina Tall, said that he was adorable, a lovely lad, but it seems he may have had some anger problems and he didn't like being told what to do. David was a keen boxer and would use his boxing skills he'd learn in his everyday life. If somebody caused him grief, he wasn't shy about using force to teach them a lesson. He was in and out of youth court, even though he was only 13 at the time he eventually disappeared, and he had been excluded from school the year before. 
He wasn't a horrible person, he just hadn't worked out how to deal with his anger and emotions properly yet it seemed, and he could very much fend for himself. Sadly, this may have inadvertently had an effect on how the media later dealt with their case. David's brother Lee later said that David was his backbone. Lee was nine when 13 year old David disappeared and he looked up to him completely. Quote, he was my backbone. If I ever needed anything, I'd go to him. He was outgoing and a good kid. Really liked his boxing. I miss having someone to talk to and someone to look up to. Someone I would look up to and want to be like. That's all gone, unquote. Nothing big had happened in either David or Patrick's lives before they went missing. It was a Christmas just like any other for both families. David got a pool table and Paddy got a new bike that he took round to David's house in the morning to show him. The two of them were best friends. They spent all day playing on this bike and eating Christmas leftovers. Paddy had the bike on him when they disappeared, a red Apollo, but several days later it was actually found by police by the waste bins at the back of the petrol station where they'd last been seen. The connection between this red bike and Paddy though wouldn't be made for several weeks even though the boys were reported as missing pretty quickly. It was the next morning on the 27th when the family started to realise that the boys had gone missing. They'd never turned up at Patrick's brother's house. I wish I could tell you if they were seen walking in the correct direction to get to the house after the petrol station, but honestly, I'm not too sure. Initially, the police believed that the boys had run away from home. They were both very streetwise children who spent most of their lives out playing. Even David's ex-teacher said, when he wasn't found, we were surprised. That was one of the things that always puzzled us. He was one of the most streetwise pupils we had at the time. The police did the usual missing persons procedures. They knocked on doors of locals and spoke to all their neighbors. They searched buildings and checked all the places where the boys were known to play. Articles about the disappearance featured in the local newspapers, hoping that someone would remember seeing something and come forward. Whilst they said they were concerned for the boys' welfare, the police weren't too concerned because they were streetwise. That's the word I saw come up time and time again whilst researching for this case, streetwise. Police told the media that there was no reason to believe the boys had come to any harm, even though there had been no sightings of them, and they might just be playing a game or staying with some friends. And because there was no huge urgency on the behalf of the police, there was no urgency in the media's eyes either. For them, they could run story after story, but then be embarrassed when it was found the boys were indeed just messing around. Nevertheless, a £500 reward was offered for any information on someone who might be hiding them. I'm not sure at which point the police and the media started to take this a little bit more seriously, realised that this wasn't just two boys playing a game. By late January, they held a press conference where the boys' mothers asked them to come home, but nothing came of this. It seems that for a long, long time, the police refused to believe this was anything other than a runaway case. I'm not sure why that was a hill they wanted to die on, especially when they eventually realised that the bike behind the petrol station belonged to Paddy, making the connection several weeks too late. The bike is key in this case. If the boys were indeed runaways, then why would Paddy have abandoned his bike behind the petrol station? A bike would be a very useful tool for any runaway. The police decided they were runaways very early on and just dug their heels in for a long time. They didn't take it seriously quickly enough. And their streetwise reputation didn't help them with the police and with the media. David and Patrick were just children, rebellious children, but children nonetheless. But they were made out to be a lot older than they were. They weren't these angelic little girls who went out for a wander to the shops and never came home. These were naughty boys who went out at midnight and clearly got themselves in a bad situation. Perhaps if they weren't from working class Chelmsley Wood and perhaps from a better off area, maybe it would be taken more seriously as well. The reaction to their disappearance was very much centred around class. As soon as the authorities are told of any missing person, child or adult, they have to quickly and probably subconsciously analyse the situation. You have to very quickly make a decision whether you immediately approach a case with urgency or if you treat it as a runaway situation, a uh, they'll come home eventually. A white young girl missing from an upper class area is likely going to be treated with urgency right away. You don't expect a middle class girl or a middle class white girl to be naughty, rebellious and run away. But two boys from what was considered to be a rough area, one of whom had been expelled from school and was reportedly a chain smoker, well, they're just misbehaving. 
It's all a subconscious, or maybe in some cases not so subconscious, bias. And as I mentioned, it's not just the police who are guilty of this, the media operate on a very similar basis. This bias against David and Patrick was perfectly encapsulated when just a few days after the boys disappeared, on New Year's Eve, 17-year-old Nicola Dixon was raped and murdered. Her body was found in a graveyard in higher class Sutton Coldfield, just seven miles away from Chelmsley Wood. Nicola's case was all over the news and sucked up a lot of the police resources in the area. Even I'll admit that I've heard of Nicola's case many times. I've never heard of David and Paddy. I'm not saying that Nicola's case didn't deserve to be spoken about by any means, but it does show what I'm trying to explain, and Nicola's case was eventually solved because it got so much attention. It was in the April that the boys became the first UK children to appear in milk cartons. The campaign was run on the four pint cartons sold in 770 Iceland stores across the country, headed by the National Missing Persons Helpline. As I covered towards the beginning of this video, a similar campaign had been running in the USA for the past couple of decades and had proven to be very helpful. But the vast majority of people buy milk on a weekly basis, or at least they did in the 90s, and this was a very easy and smart way to bring awareness to missing children ensure their face was in literally every single home. In the USA, it became a very normal thing, milk coming along with the face of a missing child. But I do have to question how effective the UK campaign was though. Whilst Iceland is a large supermarket chain, I wouldn't necessarily say it's one of the more popular ones, now or in the 90s, but maybe that's just depending on the area you're from. I'm sure plenty of people bought milk from Iceland, but it wasn't like every single person across the UK had milk specifically from Iceland in their fridge. David and Paddy's faces were run on the front of milk cartons for four weeks, but there were no major leads that came with this. The local media did pay attention though and nicknamed the boys the Milk Carton Kids, but the mainstream UK-wide media failed to pick up on the story. Unless you were from the Birmingham area or you specifically bought your milk from Iceland, you probably weren't going to hear about this case. And after that, the case just went quiet. There were no significant leads for many years and what leads did come through led nowhere. It wasn't until 2006 that the police finally classified the case as a no-body murder. They were officially looking for bodies and a murderer. And the police announced they were closer than ever to solving the mystery, but still, in 2020, we have no answers. For the 10 year anniversary of their disappearance, the boys were the subject of a BBC Crime Watch special appeal for information, but again, nothing came of this. A while later, there was actually a second Crime Watch appeal, and the police said that this one did bring fresh new leads. At this point, there was a full forensic search of both of the boys' homes, but obviously, nothing was found. They searched a nearby lake, fields and mine shafts to no avail. The kind of searching that probably should have been done immediately after the boys had been reported missing. This was now over 10 years later. Investigators checked the sex offence register and all known paedophiles in the area were questioned and eventually ruled out. At the time the boys were missing, the register didn't even exist though. But one man stuck out to investigators and that was a man called Brian Field. In 1996, Field was living in nearby Solihull, and in 1999, he'd be arrested for drink driving in Chelmsley Woods. A DNA sample taken at the scene would soon link him to an unsolved murder from 1968, that of schoolboy Roy Tuttle down in Surrey. He admitted to sexually assaulting and strangling Roy before hiding his body in his car boot, and then driving back home to his wife and newborn baby. Brian had also served a prison sentence in the 80s for kidnapping two boys. He was a former farm labourer and at the time of his 1999 arrest, he was a landscape gardener. Obviously, all of this information made him an obvious suspect in the disappearance of Paddy and David. This man was known for kidnapping and murdering young boys. Only of course, this connection wasn't made until 2006, by which point any forensic evidence that may have been around would be long gone. He was questioned at that point, and the land he used as a dumping ground at Old Danson Lane in Solihull was dug up, but there was nothing further found. He never confessed, and the police found zero evidence. But he had confessed readily when police presented him with hard forensic evidence in Roy's case. But with no such evidence, Paddy and David's, he's unlikely to speak, if it indeed was him. But he does remain a person of interest. 
In 2003, there was also a 37-year-old man arrested in connection with the boy's disappearance, but he was later released on police bail, and as far as I could find, nothing more came of this. The Guardian writes that the police had apparently received a letter saying the bodies had been buried in Woodgate Valley, and the arrest came on the back of this letter. They sent this letter for handwriting analysis, and the postmark came from Winston Green Prison. It seems the letter was anonymous, but they soon tracked down who had sent it. Despite searches in the Woodgate Valley though, they never found any traces of any bodies and the man was let go, so we can kind of assume it was all a hoax. As far as I can tell, that's all of the information we have for the case right now. It's been 24 years since the boys disappeared and there are no clues. Whilst the police have announced the case as being a nobody murder, they are also open to the idea that they may have found themselves in a tragic accident and the bodies just never happened to be found. DCI Caroline March from the homicide team at the West Midlands Police said to The Guardian in 2016, I do believe that the boys are deceased and something very serious must have happened to them. If the boys were murdered, someone knows who is responsible for that and I appeal to anyone with information to come forward. Until we find out what happened to David and Patrick, this investigation will never close. As I mentioned earlier in the video, this case was brought to my attention by recent increased media attention, just last month in November 2020. A probe was launched after human remains were found just three miles away from where the boys were last seen, near the Land Rover factory. And this is just moments away from Old Stamson Lane where the police had searched back in 2006. It was reported that teenage bones from more than one body had been found, and potential links were immediately made to David and Paddy's case. The West Midlands Police soon cordoned off the site and sent the bones for forensic and archaeological analysis. There was a chance they could have been historical remains, much, much older than 24 years, but it was said to be very likely and very plausible that it may have been David and Paddy. Only, of course, sadly, it was announced just a week or so later that the remains were not that of the boys. It was mixed emotions for the family, so of course don't want their sons to be dead, but also just want closure after a 24-year nightmare. The bones were also not linked to any other active investigation. From what I can gather, it seems they're actually pretty old. Like I mentioned, this is still an active and open investigation and not going to close this case until there are answers. If you happen to know any information about what happened to David and Patrick that night, then please contact the West Midlands Police. Even if they can only find one of the two mysteries, the bodies or the murderer, then that will help provide the family with a the closure they so deserve. Thank you so much for watching this video and I'll see you in the next one. Bye guys.